Welcome, everyone. This is Looking to the East, and I'm your host, Steve Zerker. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in uh, or viewing this. I want to welcome you to a very special show today. I have with me actually a repeat customer of mine, Jim Allen. I think this is the second or third show that uh, he has uh, contributed his wisdom uh, about the sport of baseball in Japan. So this uh, week's edition of the show, we're going to actually take a look at the history of Japanese baseball, how it came into the country from the U.S., and how it's evolved to become quite a different experience than what us Americans are used to observing in the United States. So it kind of reminds me of the quote by Winston Churchill. <clears throat> we have two countries separated by a similar language. Here we have two countries separated by a similar sport. So Jim wrote an article a few weeks ago about the history of baseball, and it caught my eye. So that's why I invited him to participate with us today. So Jim, thank you so much for waking up early here in Japan and uh, going through uh, the high points uh, of the article that you wrote about the, the history of Japan, which is 150 years old. That, that shocked me too when I saw the title. I didn't realize that baseball had been in Japan that long. So let's right. go ahead and start. I'm sorry, Jim, but let's go ahead and start with a little bit about you. How did you become a, a preeminent sports journalist, especially focusing on baseball, although I know you do other sports as well? How did you come to Japan and how did you grow to love uh, the sport of baseball in Japan? Uh, great question. I came basically because I uh, needed a job getting out of university and uh, I got a, I studied Japanese history and Japanese language in, in, uh, in university. And so teaching English in Japan was sort of an easy, easy entry. So I did that for 11, 13 years. And then in the process of that, I, I missed, uh, missed my baseball back home. I was a, a pretty fanatical San Francisco Giants fan. Me too. Yeah. And when I came, it was a pre-internet. Well, I mean, it wasn't pre-internet, but it was pre-World Wide Web. And to get the Japanese, uh, the scores of the Giants games, I needed to... Where it, I was living in a kind of a remote location where we didn't get the late papers. So to get the West Coast scores, I had to buy Japanese sports papers. And so I started when I opened them, of course, I got my line scores, you know, see how the Giants did. But what I also got were these huge box scores of Japanese uh, professional baseball games and high school, high school games even. Uh, for the national tournament, and I was just enthralled by all the information and data and and coverage that six to ten baseball games a day could get in a national paper. It was it was just amazing. So I started so you, watching. You saw how popular baseball was in Japan. Oh sure, I saw. I started watching the games, and I didn't understand the commentary that well, mm -hmm. uh, but seeing the information. And it just led me to so many questions. Why did they do it like this? Why don't they do it like that? I mean, you know the drill. When you come to a new country, you're, you, you're forced to, que to question what's normal in your country. You know, why do we do it like that? Why do they do it like that? Well, that's why do they do it like that has been essentially my obsession for the last uh, 37 years. Wow. Okay. Great. <clears throat> so it, this... Show timing is, is actually interesting because yesterday was the final match of mm. the high school baseball championship in Japan. It's called Koshien because the location of where the tournament is played, the stadium, is called Koshien. And um, <clears throat> this particular sporting event is incredibly popular. So there is an equivalent in the United States. To high school, I, I follow college baseball a little bit. There's a college World Series, but that doesn't even come close to the attention that's played to base, paid to baseball at the high school level in championship. My, my my entire family follows it every day. Otherwise, uh, my my wife is not really interested in sports. But when it comes to high school baseball championships, she knows about the team. She knows about the players who are going to the pros, and so forth. So, good timing. Yeah, it was. Uh, I, I had to think that the, one of the semifinals 
excuse me, one of the quarterfinals was probably the biggest, the biggest game of the pro baseball seasons uh, of the Japan baseball season this year, when this uh, relatively unknown high school beat one of the Japan powerhouses. And uh, in my office, so many TVs are tuned to the tournament that, and we have a well inside our building, so you can hear voices from other floors. And you could hear it echoing uh, people's response to that that victory. It was quite impressive. Yeah. So let's start with how this happened, Jim. How did baseball become so popular that the high school championship uh, tournament every summer is the most popular sporting event in the country? Yeah, that's that's a great question, too, because, you know, you wouldn't think it. But baseball came to Japan essentially because when the the Meiji Restoration came and the old feudal government was kicked out, Japan was was in a real bind and was surrounded by hostile foreign powers and had to knew the leaders the new leaders knew they had to modernize very quickly, so they started importing. Uh, sending a few people abroad, and that's kind of an accident in some ways, but some of those people who were sort of like kicked out of the country, you know, like go earn a living, came back. And one of them became kind of the father of Japanese baseball because he he picked it up in, in Philadelphia with the Philadelphia, became a fan of the Philadelphia Athletics. And he started Japan's first baseball club when he came back as a railroad engineer. Mm-hmm. And uh, also, the foreign teachers came flooding into Japan from from mostly Germany and England and the United States, mm-hmm. and the Americans taught baseball, and they taught all, lots of sports, but baseball kind of caught on, and it was just a, a confluence of so many things going on. Uh, the government's need to to create compulsory education there had been none, so okay creating compulsory education and convincing the leaders of the of the education movement to include sports, which had been an alien concept in Japan. That also amazed me. It was in your article that there wasn't really organized sports in no. the country natively. I mean, we think of sumo and martial arts as being deeply rooted in Japanese history, but there were no team sports like, like there... volleyball or... or... Or no. basketball or anything like that. It's no, remarkable. It, it was sumo and sumo was, was a thing. And uh, of course, there was uh, kendo. And although judo, came, judo was developed at the same time as baseball was introduced. And mm-hmm. for many of the same reasons to train the kids. Mm-hmm. So the teachers taught them baseball and it kind of it slowly built. But what really happened was this guy, Hiroshi Hiroka, Hir- Hiroka, who came back from uh, the states and created the first baseball team. He was a he was from an influential family, and though his family kind of wanted him to go away, he was a black sheep. He came back, and his family had connections. And at that time, Japan Japan was embracing everything modern, everything Western. People were wearing top hats and silk coats, and you know, if you had money, and people copied that. And baseball was one of the things they copied. They were teaching it in the schools, and everybody had to play baseball. Wow. Okay. So when well, one of Japan's elite high schools, there was there was essentially at the beginning just a just a handful of them around the country. Uh, had so the we're, best. What we're talking about the early 1900s, perhaps. We're talking about 18. Uh, the early 1890s by this time. Oh, okay. Wow, okay. Still in the 1800s. Okay. So baseball was introduced, was first taught in Japan uh, as as early as 1872, and that's why this year is the 150th anniversary. It might have been it it might have been taught earlier uh, by a missionary's son, but that's not quite there. There's still some question about that. So anyway, we fast forward 24 years, and there's this high school team in Tokyo. And they defeat everybody in Tokyo. And so they're sort of the Japan powerhouse, these uh, 10 or 11 schoolboys. And But baseball, really, the heart of baseball in Japan at that time was Yokohama, where 
American expatriates and a few Brits and uh, U.S. Navy uh, sailors from the Japan from the U.S. Asian Squadron would play, mm-hmm. and they were the they were the they were the the heart of baseball. And so the kids said, "We're going to play these these uh, these foreigners in Yokohama." And Yokohama was like a foreign country too because uh, the treaties that Japan had signed with America and foreign countries that allowed. Uh, foreigners in Japan to be treated uh, n- to not be uh, responsible to Japanese law for any laws they broke. They were immune. Mm-hmm. So it took a long time because the, the Americans said, no, we're not going to, the Japanese are too small. They're too weak. They're too, the Japanese men are too effeminate. You know, they take up the uh, uh, flower arranging and calligraphy and things like that. <laughs> so it took a long time, but when they got a game, the kids just beat the living daylights out of them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> They've been practicing and practicing and practicing. I mean, not not uh, not everyday practicing, which was kind of a surprise to me because I grew up reading uh, Robert Whiting stuff and, and we're good mm-hmm. friends. But it was yeah. uh, it was it was extensive practice when they had the time. Uh-huh. They couldn't practice all the time because uh, I was talking to a professor of, of uh sports history and he said well they had exams so before exams nobody practiced but it it was rigorous and they they just shocked well i don't think the people in yokohama they took it badly but what happened was it became a wave in japan it became these kids these schoolboys became national heroes in 1896 they beat the foreigners they beat the foreigners they i think that's the, the storyline yeah, I think the final the uh, the final record of the series was six wins and one loss. They lost because wow. they lost one game two to one because of two sailors. Uh, I want to say from the uh, one of the the American cruisers anchored in Yokohama, uh, they had two former pro baseball players. Okay, <laughs> a couple of ringers. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> so baseball became this really big thing. And mm-hmm. it just and as the schools, the compulsory education exploded across Japan, one of the things that they needed to do was they had to make the entrance requirements at the school much more difficult. And there, as a result of that, they stopped getting the best, uh, the best uh, stu- uh, student athlete. Mm-hmm. And the school fell on hard times. The baseball team fell on hard times. Mm-hmm. And people were look the people in the school were looking around for scapegoats. Mm-hmm. And people are the same all over the world, I suppose, and uh, and they started to reflect on the on this glorious past. You know, we have to recapture this this the past glories of Japanese baseball from five years before when we were really good. And the way they did that, eventually, another conflict of a lot of things was the uh, the rise of college baseball and the the popularity and Japan's growing economy pumped all this money into this amateur sport mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. college pay, players were getting paid to to attend uh, events uh if there was a tournament with college and high school players where there was a star player um the star player would get money under the table to make sure he was there at the event mm-hmm. uh there was uh, all kinds of things going on, and it was considered the, the sport was getting kind of a bad reputation. Players were sort of uh, seeing themselves sort of like American college, you know, Big Ten college football players. Right. You know, yes. big, big, bigger than the law. Yep. And state, you know, comes to mind. A lot yeah, of, that... you know, Texas schools come to mind. Sure. And it was it was a it was so popular that there became a wave, kind of a backlash. But it was a popular backlash. People loved baseball, but newspapers would sell anything with baseball. So there was a, a bunch of uh, a lot of jur- uh, journalists and former players who attacked the game as unworthy of Japanese. Oh, and so wow. with that backlash, and the increasing popularity of the sport running hand in hand. They created this high school baseball tournament. What right, which is what we talked about at That's the correct. top of the show, the Koshien tournament. Yeah, it had already been a small tournament, but the Asahi, uh, the the Osaka Asahi Shimbun 
the newspaper was basically only big in Tokyo and Osaka. And they wanted to go nationwide. So they said, you know, if we had a nationwide baseball tournament, uh, people would read our newspaper to read about what their kids are doing, <laughs> you know, their local heroes are doing. In, yeah. At the beginning, it was in, uh, I think, Toyonaka in Osaka. And it worked. It just became, it, it was, they made it. So it was like looking back on that past you know, the past glories of the high school kids and not this dirty college game. And they they wanted to make this sort of artificial history of baseball. And the funny thing is that artificial history of baseball became the, the absolute core of Japanese baseball. The kids, you know, and you know, now it's on national television and it's so big. It's so, everybody's, uh, enculturated to follow high school baseball and for most japanese yeah, just, high school baseball is baseball literally for our viewers if you get into a taxi cab during the tournament period you are listening to the game sure because every taxi cab driver mostly male 95 percent male are listening to koshien it's, it's it's automatic and the the regional tournament when i was in sapporo once uh, I don't know why I was in Socorro in uh, July or August, but mm -hmm. the taxi the, the taxi driver was July, and he had the the uh, we, one of the Socorro the local Socorro tournament was on the radio, mm -hmm. you know. So the school from uh, you know two towns in rural Hokkaido was on <laughs> the on the radio, and the taxi driver was was riveted to it. Yeah. Yeah, my my son <clears throat> is on a high school team, as you know, Jim, and he uh, started pitching. He was a starting pitcher for the first tournament game oh. uh, in Osaka. And now they're in, in Osaka, they're web broadcasting oh. all tournament games. So you no matter where you are in the prefecture, you can watch your son play in the game. So I, I was in Hawaii at the time, but mm -hmm. I was able to watch the entire game. And we're we're really a little bit out of time, Jim. So let's let's move forward to the section in the article where you talk about how Japan kind of re recreated or reimagined the sport to fit with these issues that you have discussed about the early history of the sport and how the government was involved in as well. That also surprised me that the Japanese government took an interest in this sport and helped well, to create what it is actually still today. Well, the, the government basically said uh, it, it started the first uh, game where they sold tickets to a Japanese baseball game was because this team from Honolulu was touring Japan and they had mm -hmm. to defray the cost. So they charged admission mm -hmm. and the baseball touring became a it became a big money thing. University of Wisconsin, University of Washington, Stanford University, uh, University of Chicago and uh, the Japanese universities were uh, traveling across the Pacific. There was a lot of money being made and the government was saying, this is kind of unseemly. So we're going to put a stop to that. American pro baseball players had been visiting Japan, but they had to play against college students. There were only college students. They had to play against amateurs. So the government said, no more, no more of this. You can't play against professionals. So when a mm -hmm. uh, Japanese team uh, created, that was 1932, they made the laws. So in 1934, they invited Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and Charlie Gehringer and a number of other big MLB stars to Japan to sell tickets. They couldn't get a team because all the college. So what they did was the Yomiuri Shimbun created a team in order to sell tickets mm -hmm. to these games, period, end of story. Mm -hmm. But it became an idea that, wait, hold on a second. We can go now on tour. So they went to America and then they came back and they said, you know, we could create a pro league. So they created a pro league. But that divide between amateurs and professionals has remained to this day. It's, it's really it's a it's a great wall. Of, you know, it's a it's a firewall mm -hmm. the government okay. built and the government got really involved. And the government has always had a view of, you know, I guess the point is not is not so much the government as as baseball's always been what Japanese wa wanted it to be. You know, mm -hmm. when when Japan needed to to show that it had strength, it it was a modern nation. 
in a in a hostile world they had these kids from yokohama beating the americans at their game and then when japan was conquering uh, conquering east asia uh, colonizing east asia they needed uh to sort of rekindle that martial spirit mm -hmm. so let's be like that and then when japan was again trying to reinvent itself in the 1930s we have to have pure baseball and now you know now we find uh, Japan reinventing itself again, or trying to reinvent itself, and it's, it's a hard slog because mm -hmm. Koshien's created this great uh, uh, movement. You know, as you said about the shaved head, you know, this is an old thing, and right. no nobody really does that anymore. But it's it's a tradition that is still big in Koshien. So yeah, for for our viewers, uh, for these games, it's traditional for the players to shave their heads to demonstrate team spirit and uh, a unified effort to do the very best you can on the field. And that affects all levels of the sport, even at the elementary school level. I mean, I have pictures of my second son uh, when he was playing on a particularly uh, a severe uh, elementary school team, the coach was, he, he never said you had to do this, but of course he was saying you had to do this, right? Indirectly. In, in Japanese, it's so easy to not say what you really want to say, but everyone understands what you are saying. It's one of the wonderful things about the mm. Japanese language. So 100% kids, and my son didn't want to do it, but he really had no choice. So that, that's a, an example of what Jim was talking about in terms of this Samurification, if that's mm -hmm. there's such a word, or this kind yeah. of indoctrination of a foreign sport to adhere to Japanese national ideals. Sure, that's that was so much a part of uh, 19th century Japan was taking what what showing what we can do with overseas technology. You know, when we get a chance. So that that was a big thing, and then when the war came. I was I was talking to a professor. He told me that all the professors, all the school teachers in Japan, had to go to college. And until the Pacific War turned into World War II, until the war in China became a war with the United States, none of the college students were being drafted. So eventually, what happened was they then got a military education, and when they came back after the war baseball changed. It went from being this kind of uh, imaginary samurai tradition, and there was sort of, uh, there was some like physical abuse was not really a thing. But after the war, it became uh, corporal punishment mm -hmm. and beatings by seniors became pretty standard because that was yeah. the, the education, the college, you know, the teachers learned in, in the military. This is part of discipline. Mm -hmm. And so that became a thing. But now that's kind of going out of the way. Parents aren't really keen about having their kids getting beat up. Yeah. And it used I, to I have be to tell you, though, Jim, I, I saw that once myself at the elementary sure. school level and, was, and the parents were there. So that was a that was a shock for me to watch. It, it's, so, but it, I think it's rare. It's, I only saw it once in how many years have my kids been in baseball? Ten years now? Yeah, now now got now people can be uh, sued and, and arrested for that. So that's going out of the way. And things yeah. like, um, I, I guess the the final thing was, you know, how can we th this question now of falling birth rates and not having enough kids to play baseball? It's right. like, well, how can we deal with this? Well, we have to get the parents to okay and let their kids play this sport. So we have to make it more. Uh, accessible. We have to make it more humanistic, and we're just seeing those inroads. Uh, and I think Roki Sasaki is the 20-year-old pitcher for the Chibalote Marines, and he threw a uh, perfect game in April. And the the next game, he threw eight perfect innings, and he was pulled out of the game. Mm -hmm. But he's he's sort of the uh, He's sort of the face of this new baseball because when he was in high school, his coach took extra care of his arm and mm -hmm. all his classmates' arms, and he sat him out from the regional final, mm -hmm. and it caused quite a disturbance in the force. Mm -hmm. uh, half yeah, the people, I, I, I think, the historically, 
he would have been forced to or would have been required to pitch in every single game, even if sure. they were back to back to back. Sure. And it was the coach lost his job eventually. Oh, because of this issue, Jim? Yeah. Two years oh, later, he was asked wow. to step down. Wow. He's, he's actually he was sort of shoved aside. He's now the assistant of the director of the baseball department at, at the Ofunata High School in Iwate Prefecture. But yeah, uh, but the whole thing, I guess the lesson from this is that was 2019. In 2022, when Sasaki is a pro, they pulled him out of a his potentially second straight perfect game in the ninth inning. And people went, okay, we get it. And I think 10 years ago, Japanese pro baseball couldn't do that. Right. And, and people would not have understood if they had. And now they do it and people understand. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a huge thing you know they're still shaving their head mm -hmm. but the game is changing and yeah at the at the high school level and also at the club level of junior high starting this year for my my younger son's uh tournament games they announced the number of pitches inning by inning mm -hmm. and then sometimes the coaches are they're not aware of this rule there was one game that i was watching where the opposing pitcher through the limit, I, I don't know what the limit was, maybe like 90 pitches. I and think then it's the like 500. Said, I think it's like 500. Is it what level? This is per game. Did they have per game limits? At okay, least at so the, he's a, it's at, a junior, at the high, junior high level. Okay, yes, yes. And the announcer just said, the pitcher needs to be removed. <laughs> and the, the manager had not been warming up anybody. So I think he was surprised that these pitch counts are actually being enforced. And yeah. He couldn't keep his number one pitcher in for the duration of the game past the pitch count. So you're yeah. right. There are signs that uh, it's changing, and I totally agree with you too, Jim, that uh, the burden on the kids, also the burden on the parents mm. to prepare the kids for practice four times a week, and you're kind of obligated to go to games. Again, you're not told you have to go, but you're obligated to go, and it's a tremendous pressure on the families, and many parents who have come to look at the teams that my sons have been involved in decide not to participate because it's just too much of a burden. And mm. all of these uh, demands that are placed on the players and on the parents is, is just too much in today's modern world. Yeah, uh, particularly on the, on the on the mothers. <laughs> you know, exactly. Show up at Pratt. Not only make the make the lunches, but serve tea after practice to the coaches. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, my son's junior high team. The coaches eat first, then the fathers eat. And then the mothers eat. I, I, I couldn't believe it. The mothers have to wait until the fathers have finished eating. This is, I don't know where what tradition that is bound to, but it still exists today at the club school level, at least for my son's wow. team. Wow. Hey, Jim, we've run out of time, as I knew we would, on this very, very interesting issue. You know, it's, it's fascinating to me to look at how sport and culture and, to some extent, politics, government activity, influences organized uh, sporting act sporting events like baseball and that you and I as Americans, when we watch the game of uh, Japanese baseball, we can clearly see that it's different. It's very, very enjoyable. You know, there's mm. no question. I, I love Japanese baseball, but it is different for the reasons that your article and what you have explained over the last half hour. So any concluding comments, Jim, on that? Do you have, are, are you going to be writing an article about the future of Japanese baseball next? Uh, I can interview un you about undoubtedly, <laughs> undoubtedly. Well, actually, the, I guess the next one will be about how Japanese baseball has influenced uh, baseball around the world, which is more of a future thing. Oh, but, interesting. Uh, but the inter I guess the other thing is that if you look at American baseball, you'll find that the same sort of the same thing is going on in the United States. If you look at American baseball and you see the way MLB owners speak about the minor leagues you'll see just the absolute reflection you know when they talk about minor league players it's not that different from jeff bezos talking about unionization of the amazon uh, distribution centers mm -hmm. they're they are happy at their work yeah yeah all right jim well thank you again so much or waking up early on Tuesday morning uh, no and, my pleasure it's, it's yeah always a joy. this is so much fun i enjoy talking to you so much and um, 
So I want to thank all our viewers for uh, tuning into the show or watching. Uh, this may be on uh, Community TV, Jim, later, or also okay. be rebroadcast on the Think Tech website. So my show will be on hiatus for the next slot because of the upcoming Labor Day holiday, but we'll be back on again in a month or so with another topic about looking to the East. So once again, thank you so much, Jim, and goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.